Okay, guys, so uh, today's topic uh, for our level up training is I put out a survey in the chat of some of the things that you guys need training on. And Alessandra pointed a good one out, just going over disclosures and what are some of the things you want to look for in the disclosures. So I want to go over the, the TDS, the transfer disclosure statement, and the seller property questionnaire, the, it's the SPQ. And just kind of go through those and, and talk about those and kind of what to look for and what things stand out and stuff like that. Now, when you look at disclosures, guys, when you get a disclosure packet, it's going to have a bunch of stuff, right? It's going to have the transfer disclosure, the SPQ. It's going to have the AVID, you know, the agent's visual inspection. It's going to have the inspection reports, the prelim, um, the NHD report. There's so many things in there and it's a lot of pages. and but I think it's important to kind of go step by step because it's hard to cover everything just in one training. It's, it's, it's a little overwhelming. So I think for today, I just want to talk about the, S, the SPQ and the transfer disclosure. And then we'll do another training on just looking at the inspection reports. We'll do one on just understanding the prelim. Uh, so you can go deep with these. Now, these trainings, it's these are more overviews, right? But you want to spend some time. The best way to learn about disclosures is to actually just read them right like i can only tell you so much here but if you don't open up a disclosure packet and read them line for line and go through all the pages and familiarize yourself with what's in there uh you know that's gonna it's gonna be like foreign language right so if you want to get good at disclosures it doesn't matter if you have a client you're working with you can go on the mls and pull up a property and download the disclosures and just read through disclosures on three different properties. And that'll give you some good exposure, right? Um, it'll give you some good exposure as to, okay, here's a condo. This is what they put in there. Here's a single family. Maybe here's a different property. And you'll see like, you'll see the differences in, in the different properties, right? And what they list on there. Um, some agents are way more thorough. Some clients are way more thorough as well when they're filling those things out. And some clients don't put a lot of information. So that's kind of what you're working with. Um, but it's important to familiarize yourself with those because when you do end up submitting an offer on a property, you're going to have to do go over the disclosures with your client, right? You're going to have to do it an offer consultation where you go over the offer, the comps, the disclosures, what to look out for. And the more that you can understand these and know what to look out for, the better that you can provide value to your clients, just like I was mentioning to Alessandra, right? If you can tell your client right off the bat, hey, you know, Brianna, I looked at the disclosures on this property and, you know, they're were, they were really, they look really good. There's nothing in there. Um, there was this one thing that I want to point out that I think, you know, you should be aware of. But now you're coming from a place of like, you're giving this client information that she, that she wouldn't have known about. And that makes you more valuable as an agent when you're already a couple steps ahead of the client and you're able to uh, present that information up front to them, right? Versus just showing up to a property, showing the house, right? You know, and not having anything really to talk about, right? So uh, I want to touch on this a little bit because learning the disclosures is, is the easy part, but knowing why you need to, you know, learn them and how to use them effectively so that you can be more valuable to your clients is important. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're going to do an open house. Looking at the disclosures beforehand and going through all the disclosures, the reports, the inspections, researching the neighborhood, learning the comps, learning what also what's for sale in that neighborhood, what other properties have sold recently, all those things is going to, those, that's going to be ammunition for when clients are coming in the door and you're able to display your value to them. Versus just showing up the day of, maybe this is a property you've never been to, maybe it's someone else's listing, and you're kind of coming in blind. Well, how do you expect to be really valuable at that open house to the clients that are walking in? So it starts with preparation, right? Doing your homework ahead of time so that you can be that much more effective at the open house. Same thing when you're going on showings, right? When you're going to show properties, Pull up the disclosures, take a quick glance at them, look at the inspection reports, look at the summary. There's a summary page, usually on the inspection reports. You can look over the transfer disclosure, you know, really quickly. And you can now have some notes that you write down. So when you show this home, you can start pointing these things out to the client while you're in the showing. 
right? Um, I mentioned before that to succeed in today's market, it requires you to step your game up, right? It requires you to go from, you know, amateur or entry-level agent to elite agent, right? To advisor, to consultant, those type of, you know, titles and having that mentality that I need to bring a tremendous amount of value to clients during this time, because there is a lot of uncertainty, right? There's a lot of uncertainty with the market. There's a lot of uncertainty in the news. So the more that you can reassure clients on why this is a good deal, why this is a good property, why the disclosures are clean, why the inspection reports look good, all those things, it helps create certainty for your client, right? So when it's time to get them to move forward to write an offer, you've made them feel so great about the process that there's less hurdles that you got to tackle. Does that make sense, guys? Um, so I always like training you guys to understand the mindset behind it, right? Because when you understand the mindset, then you'll see why it's important. Um, let me see. Someone put a note. Carla, also, if the client is working with another agent, the disclosures are your armor to win. That's a great point that you made, uh, Carla, because most agents don't do this. Most agents just show up. Hey, let's go see a house. They show up, meet them at the property. They didn't do any research. They kind of wing it, right? And when you're that agent that did, did the homework, that did all these things, and you go meet them, and then they go meet another agent who didn't do any of that, it's like two different experiences, right? They're like, man, when I met Alessandra, like, dude, she was on it. Like, she had all this information. She told me all these little details about the property, about the neighborhood, about the disclosures, the inspections. And then when I met this other guy, like it seemed like I knew more about the property than him, you know, like he, he just turned the lights on and let me walk through the property and open the door. So you don't want to be just a door opener, right? You want to be someone that the client sees as uh, a resource, the knowledgeable person, the person of value that I should go work with. Um, Carla said, put yourself in their shoes. Who would you work for the most? right? The one that's the most detailed or the person who's just winging it. Absolutely. Right. And here's the great thing, guys, is that most agents, a high percentage of them just wing it. Let me say that one more time. Most agents out there, they just wing it because they're not trained in a lot of these things that we're talking about. They're not trained on, you know, going deep on the sales stuff and the mindset and all that. They just get their license and then they go out there and try to figure things out. Right. So these little things, although to you guys, it may not be like magic, right? But it's these little things that make you a better agent, right? A more skilled person. And we're, we're fighting for inches a lot of times, right? Sometimes they're, they're interviewing multiple agents, whether it's to buy or sell. And it's these little small things that give you that edge or that give you that advantage, right? And those compound and pay off over time. Right. So uh, I want you to understand the mindset behind it. Um, any questions, guys, before we pull up these uh, two disclosures to kind of go through? Feel free to type in the chat, guys, anything that comes up, any comments, any suggestions, any questions that come up about this, and then we'll, we'll tackle them as we go. All right. Let me share my screen. So. All right, can you guys see my screen? Everyone see my screen? Give me a thumbs up. All right, cool. Uh, okay, so first one we're gonna go through guys is the real estate transfer disclosure. Um, there's two main disclosures that, the, that a seller has to fill out, right? So anytime they're gonna sell a property, they have to fill out the real estate transfer disclosure, which is known as the TDS for short, right? You'll hear TDS, TDS, transfer disclosure statement. And then there's the SPQ, which is the seller property questionnaire. And essentially what these are, number one, they're, they're required by the state of California. If you sell a property, you have to disclose what you know about the property. Now, let me uh, emphasize, they have to disclose what they know about the property, right? Because there could be things going on with the property that they don't know about. For example, let's say like there's a leak inside the wall and they don't know there's a pipe leaking in the wall. Um, 
they wouldn't be able to disclose that if they don't know about that, right? So that's the part where it's a little tricky because there's going to be some things that are going on with properties that the seller just doesn't know about, right? So it's to the best of their knowledge that they have to disclose these things and fill out these questionnaires. Um, and you're going to get the transfer disclosure is going to go through certain points and we're going to go through these one by one and then we'll go ahead and ask any questions. And feel free to stop me guys at any time. Feel free to raise your hand or feel free to uh, type a question in the chat so that we can make sure everyone understands these. Um, so first one here, guys, uh, transfer disclosure statement, you'll see it's they're going to fill out the property address at the top. And this statement is a disclosure of the condition of the above property as of this date, right? So whatever date they filled it out, they're saying as of this date, this is what I know. Um, it is not a warranty of any kind by the sellers or any agents representing any principals and is not substitute for any inspections or warranties, right? So it's not a warranty. They're not guaranteeing, but they're saying, hey, this is to the best of my knowledge, what I know. It doesn't excuse the buyer from doing their own research. If they want to do further inspections, if there's something on here where they're like, hey, that doesn't sound too clear. I want to get an inspection or send a contractor out there. Then that's what the client should do. Um, it's gonna have a box right here if there's any inspection reports that are attached to this, right? So a lot of times the sellers will do inspections up front and they'll say, hey, in addition to this, we did inspections and we're attaching them to this transfer disclosure. Um, there will be some cases where the seller is exempt from filling these out. So for example, if it's a trust, uh, let's say like someone died and then like I inherited the property and now I'm selling this property that I inherited. Well, I never lived in the property. The person that lived there passed away. So I don't know the answers to any of these questions. So a lot of times when it's a trust sale or a probate sale, or if it's part of like an inheritance, you'll see a lot of times these are exempt, which means they don't have to fill them out. So you're kind of left to do your own homework and do your own inspections and stuff like that. Now, this first part, they're going to check this box that says seller is or seller is not occupying the property, right? And that's important too, because if, it, let's say it's a rental property, if they've never occupied it for years, or if it's always been a rental, there may be limited knowledge on what they know, right? Versus if they have lived in the property, then they're going to know more stuff about it. This whole first section right here is they're checking what is in the property, what comes with the property to the best of their knowledge. Now, this is important because if they check something and they say, for example, uh, they check this box that says range. Yeah, like the property has a range and it has an oven. And then later on, there's no range and there's no oven when you're going to buy the property. Well, now we have an issue because they said this includes that. And then when you go to close the deal, there's no, pro there's no range or oven in there. The buyer can come back and say, hey, this is what you disclosed. This is what you said came with the property. So that needs to be replaced or that needs to be put in there. Um, so they're just going to go down the line, right? Is there a range? Is there an oven, microwave, dishwasher, trash compactor, rain gutters? And they're going to check every box. Is there air conditioning, sprinklers? Is there a garage? Is it attached? Is it not attached? Are there any garage door openers? This is sometimes where people get in trouble, like, yeah, there's two garage door openers. And then at the end of the sale, you can't find that the garage door openers and you're like, hey, you guys said they were included. I need you to produce two garage door openers because we bought the property based off what you disclosed to us, right? Is there a pool? Does it come with a heater? Is it gas, solar, electric, right? Where does the water come from? Is it a city water or is it like, is this a rural property where there's a well? Um, window screens, those are things too. Let's say they they check the box that there's screens on all the windows and then come to find out there's no screens on the windows, right? Now you might have, you know, a dispute there. Um, they're gonna talk about exhaust fans. So like exhaust fans are like uh, fans like in the bathrooms or like in the laundry that, you know, sucks up the air or the moisture. Are there fans? Um, the fireplace, right? Is there a fireplace? Where is it at? The roof, this is one that always kind of comes up because sometimes people don't know how long the roof has been there. Um, so they'll disclose what kind of roof it is and then they'll put approximately uh, what the age of the roof is. 
And then right here, this is an important one, this last question on this page. To the best of the seller's knowledge, are any of the following not in operating condition? Yes or no, right? So let's say you do have a microwave that's built in, but it's not working. You're gonna to wanna to put no, and you're gonna to wanna to explain the microwave's not working, right? Or yes, there is AC, but the AC is, you know, doesn't work, right? Stuff like that. So that's where the seller will put in some details. And if they have to add more pages, they'll do that or they'll continue on the other side um, and get into detail. Okay, so let's stop right there, guys. Any questions about this first part? Questions, comments, concerns? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Second page. Are you the seller aware of any significant defects or malfunctions of the following? Any of the walls, the ceilings, the floors, uh, insulation, the roof, the windows, the doors, the foundations, driveways, sidewalks, other structural components, the plumbing, electrical system. So if they check yes, anytime there's a yes that's checked, there has to be an explanation, right? If any of the above checked, explain. They can put additional sheets if they need more room to explain. Now, the, we got to remember, guys, that the seller is not always an expert, right? They can say, hey, yeah, the roof is leaking, but you don't know to what extent the roof is leaking, right? So that's why a lot of times you're going to want to look at the inspection reports to see, okay, they checked yes here, but let's look at the report. And, what was that? Uh, please mute yourself. You guys just jumped on. Um, yeah, so they're going to want to they're going to want to look at the inspection reports to kind of go with this information here, right? If they say the foundation, they say they checked foundation. Yeah, there's a crack in the foundation. Well, a foundation is a major issue, so you're probably going to want to look at inspection reports to see to what extent the foundation is is you know messed up or cracked. A cracked foundation doesn't always mean that the home's not livable, right? So there's different levels to it, right? So you're going to want to find out more details. So if you're representing the seller, you wanna make sure the seller lists everything because that is also their uh, CYA, right? Cover your ass. The more stuff you list, the more that you disclose and be upfront with the buyers, then they can't come back later and say, hey, you didn't, you didn't tell me about this or you knew about this and you didn't tell me. Same thing with the buyer, right? If you're, if you're the buyer's agent and you're looking through these things, well, you're gonna to wanna, to you know, do some due diligence for the client, right? You're going to, if it says the foundation's cracked or there's some issue, you're probably going to want to look at the inspection reports and then be able to give the client a briefing on, on, you know, to what extent or what's going on right there, All right? So that they're not surprised. Um, any questions, guys, on what's required for the seller to disclose right here in these, in these areas? Okay. Uh, I know this isn't the fun part, guys, the sexy part, but it's definitely important, right? It's important because the last thing you want someone to do is buy a property and not know what they're getting themselves into, right? Or sell a property, help a seller sell their property, and they fail to disclose something, and the buyer comes back and sues them, right? So there are lawsuits that can happen, guys. Like if the biggest lawsuit that happens with real estate all the time is failure to disclose information, right? You knew about something, you didn't check it on there, you didn't include it, the buyer comes back and sues you and there's, or there's some sort of dispute over the disclosures. Um, okay, so this part right here, are you aware of any of the following? So any substances, materials, lead-based paint, asbestos, mold, in the property, anything like that, they have to, these are all yes or no. Uh, features shared in common, right? Most homes have shared fences. So there's a fence in between the house and there's a house on each side. So nine times out of 10, this is gonna say yes. And then they'll put, they'll put an explanation. Uh, any encroachments, easements or similar matters that may affect your interest in the property. So uh, an encroachment or an easement, that could be like, there's a power line that runs through the property that belongs to PG&E, right? So that encroaches on your property or there's an easement 
where um, there's a road that goes through the property or an alleyway or something where people have to be able to drive through, right? So people have access to, to pass through your property. So anything like that, right? That, that would affect um, the interest in the property. Um, number four right here, room addition, structural modifications, or any alterations or repaired made without necessary permits. This one right here, guys, is almost always yes, right? Because people do repairs, they do modifications, stuff like that without permits, right? Because technically you're supposed to get a permit for anything you do to property. Like if you change windows, if you change the kitchen, you're supposed to get permits for this stuff, but a lot of people don't get permits for these things. So a lot of times you'll see a yes, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It just means, you know, they could have hired a contractor or a handyman, but they didn't go through with the permits. Now, where you're gonna wanna be careful is if they did anything structurally, right? Like if they removed walls or if they added a room or if they changed the structure of a property and it wasn't permitted, because then we don't know if it was done to code or if it was done correctly, where that could become like a safety issue, right? So anytime you see yes, you're gonna to wanna to investigate a little bit more to see if it's something that you should be concerned about or not. And that goes to question number five, any additions, modifications or alterations not in compliance with building codes. So sometimes you can have someone that added a back room and like you could totally tell like they, it wasn't to code, right? It looks funky. It wasn't like, it just looks like they, they did it on the weekend by themselves or something like that. And that's where you wanna get some more clarification on those things. All right, questions or comments, guys? Let me know if I'm losing you because I know the, these things kind of are a little boring at, at times. Um, but like I said, it's important you know these things. Number six, fill, compacted or otherwise. That's like where they, they anybody come and add like uh, dirt or anything like that to fill in certain areas or they did add anything to the ground or anything like that. Um, any settling, slippage, drainage problems, soil problems, um, right? Let's say like when it rains, like there's a drainage issue. There's always puddles in the backyard because it's not draining properly, right? That's something that you'd want to know about. Any major damage from fires, earthquakes, landslides, any zoning violations, right? Maybe there's something with the zoning where it was done illegally or not to code. Any neighborhood noise problems or nuisances? Uh, most homes have noise, right? Like if there's kids that play outside, if there's a school next door, down the street, right? So it just depends to what extent. If you live by an airport, you got the airplanes flying over all the time, you might see that on there. Um, it's just if it's something where it's a common, you know, noise or noise problem or nuisance, then they list it there. Um, CCNRs and other deed restrictions or obligations. Who knows what CCNRs mean? Anybody knows what those means that can explain that? Like the rules, the covenants of the neighborhood. Correct. Yeah. So when properties were built, right, um, a lot of these homes were built way back in the days. They could have added um, CCNRs, right? It's covenants. I forgot exactly what it stands for. It's covenants. Uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. So covenants and restrictions, basically, they could have said, okay, for this neighborhood, um, we made these rules when we built the property and we filed with the county that you can only build townhomes in this neighborhood or they can only be single family homes or they can only um, be two story or single story, right? There could have been rules that follow the property and the land um, from when it was uh, built, right? Now, back in the days, if the home is really old, there could have even been some things that had to do with race, right? Where there was discrimination and stuff like that. Um, and I've seen those like for homes that are really old, they could have said like only a certain type of people can live in this neighborhood. Um, those things don't really apply no more. Right. Cause since they've, you know, come out with, you know, laws and stuff to prevent discrimination, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. That's what it was. Uh, thanks Carmen. 
Um, so sometimes not all properties come with these, right? But a lot of them do. And you're going to want to read those. And a lot of times if they were really old, the document looks extremely old as well. Sometimes it's hard to even read them. Uh, sometimes they're just in black and white and a little bit funky. Um, and also some of them are not enforced as well, right? Because times have changed and some of these may have been written a long time ago. They're not necessarily enforced. So it's up to you to kind of do your homework on these and, and see if that's something that's still being enforced. Let's say, for example, this house was built in, you know, early 1900s and they said you can only have a one story property in this neighborhood. Right. But you've seen that in the neighborhood, there's two story houses now. Right. So even though there's a CCNR that says only one story over time, the city came came in and took over and allowed certain things to happen to happen. Right. Or the homes can only be painted a certain color or you can only have one style of home. Right. Um, and now you see other styles of homes in that neighborhood. So you got to do your homework if there's something that really stands out. Um, 13, homeowners association, right? So if it's a condo townhouse, it's going to have a homeowners association. So that's just saying, are there, is there an association that manages or has authority over the property? And if they check yes, then that means there's an HOA. You're going to want to do your homework and re research those documents and understand exactly what the restrictions are, because that could be a whole another set of rules and regulations for that particular property because it's in a homeowners association. Uh, any common areas such as pools, tennis courts, walkways, anything co-owned, you'll see that you know in condos, townhouses, any sort of properties that have like a complex. Um, number 15, any notices of abatement or citations against the property, right? So there could be like the city, um, gave a citation toward the to the landlord or to the owner. Maybe there's something that's unpermitted. Maybe they red tagged the property because someone called the city on them. You'll see that sometimes. So you want to know about that stuff before you move forward to see if it's something that you can address or fix or work out with the seller before you move forward on buying. Um, 16, any lawsuits against the property? Uh, it could be like, are you suing someone? Are they suing you? It could be a condo, a townhouse. Is it in litigation where there's a lawsuit going on? It could be, are there any claims uh, for any damages? Maybe it's like a, something with your insurance and there's a lawsuit with the insurance, anything like that. Um, anything that would affect the property needs to be disclosed there. Um, and then the last thing was, yeah, so that's it. So now this last little section in gray right here. So if they answered yes to any of these, then they have to put a, an explanation. So let's say number, number two is, is usually always yes, shared uh, walls, fences. So if they put yes, then they'll put, a, they'll put number two and then they'll put you know shared fence with the neighbor, right? And then they'll put that there. Um, or if they put yes, there is a, a zoning violation. They'll put yeah, a number, they'll reference the, phone, the number on the line and then they'll put the explanation there. So those are things that I quickly look for, right? If I'm gonna look at disclosures, I'm gonna go to this section and I'm gonna see, is anything marked yes? And usually the yeses are the ones that you wanna address and, and figure out if it's an issue. Um, these last ones, um, D1 and 2, seller certifies that the property as of the close of escrow will be in compliance with health and safety codes, which has to do with smoke detectors, uh, strapping the water heater and stuff like that. So it's just saying that the, the seller is saying that those will be in compliance. And then they're going to sign these. And the agent is required to do a, an AVID, the visual inspection, where the agent goes out there and walks the property and writes any notes down of anything he sees. And that is usually going to be attached to this document as well. So you can see the agent's notes on the property. All right, guys, that is the TDS. A lot of info, right? A lot of information. Um, not the funnest part, right? But the necessary part. The main thing, guys, is... If you're gonna, you know, write an offer or if you're gonna go show a property, like pull these up and just scan them, right? Scan through them real quick and see if there's any yeses, right? Because anything they check yes is gonna be the things that stand out, right? Those are gonna be the things that they're saying, yes, there is this thing going on with the property. If they're all no, 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 and there's not, no explanations, no nothing, 
then the seller is telling you that everything's clean on the property. If there's nothing that stands out. If there's any yeses, those are the ones you quickly want to go to and understand what's going on. And those are things you can uh, point out to the client or as you're walking the property, you can verify, okay, they check yes here. There's a fence. Okay. Yeah. I see the fence that they're talking about. It's a shared fence on this side, or there's a, there's noise because of the school. And yeah, you get there and there's a school right behind the property. And yeah, you can hear the noise when the kids are playing or whatever. So going through the yeses really quick are, are going to help you quickly identify what things that you want to look out for and then what things you may need to do further research on, like look at the inspection reports to see how it matches up and stuff like that. Um, okay. 12, 12, we're going to go over the SPQ and that's it. That's enough for today, guys. A lot of stuff. Um, So let's go back to forms. Oh, where are my documents? Here we go. Seller property questionnaire. Um, so this is part two of the disclosure, right? So every seller has to fill this out. And once again, some sellers may be exempt if it's part of a trust or anything like that, where they've never lived in the property and they don't know any of this information. But in addition to the transfer disclosure, the TDS that we just went through, this is the SPQ. And uh, note to seller, you are strongly advised to carefully review the disclosure information advisory before you complete the seller property questionnaire. All sellers of California real estate are required to provide various disclosures either by contract or by statute or by case law. Many disclosures must be made within certain time limits. Timely and thorough disclosures help to reduce disputes and facilitate a smooth sales transaction. There's a tongue twister there, right? So this is just advising the seller like, hey, it's your job to disclose everything about this property. The more thorough, the more you can fill this out, the more you can be upfront, you are essentially releasing yourself of liability, right? Because every property that someone buys even if it's a brand new property, right? There's less stuff with brand new properties, but every property that's a resale where someone's lived in it and it's a used home, there's going to be some issue with the property, right? There's, there's maintenance, there's stuff that's happened over, over the years. There's always something with the property and not every seller or homeowner takes care of the property the same. And you guys may have noticed that, right? You've showed homes and you can totally tell like, now this home is clean. You can tell it's clean. You can tell everything looks organized. Like you can tell by the way it's it's maintained that it's a uh, it's 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 a property that someone's really taking good care of, right? Like even when you open the drawers and stuff, they have everything organized. All their spoons, all their knives. Like there's labels. Like there's uh, stuff that they provide on the countertop. Maybe it's like uh, owners' guides or owners' manuals. So there are some some sellers or homeowners that they just take care of their properties really well, right? They treat it like a prized possession. And then you can go in some other properties and it's just like a nightmare in there, right? You can totally tell it's dingy. Like maybe they painted it for the listing, but you can tell it's just not a well-maintained property, right? You see stuff just going on and a good indicator is like how someone takes care of their, their lawn, right? Like is their lawn manicured, right? How it looks, are there spider webs and all kinds of stuff everywhere. So just know that there's different levels to how someone takes care of their property. So let's go through this really quick. Um, so they're going to fill out, you know, the property information, right? Address and all that good stuff. Uh, disclosure limitation. The following are representations made by the seller and are not the representations of the agents, right? So basically saying that this is the seller that's telling you what they know. It's not intended to be a uh, part of the contract unless otherwise in writing. Um, but it's basically the seller is, is disclosing this stuff to the buyer. Uh, note to seller, the purpose, to tell the buyer anything known material fact or significant items affecting the value or desirability will help eliminate misunderstandings about the condition of the property. Just what we said, right? Why they need to provide that. Helps reduce liability, disputes, lawsuits, and stuff like that. Note to the buyer, to give you more information about no material significant items affecting the property. Um, that's what this is for. 
if something is important to you, be sure to put your concerns and questions in writing. The seller can only disclose what they actually know. The seller may not know about certain things. Like I said earlier, if there's something going on in the roof and the sellers never walked on the roof, they don't know what's going on up there. They don't know what's going on in between the walls or underneath the property. They only know what they see visually and interact with on a daily basis. Um, so we got that. So documents, right? Are there going to be uh, any reports, inspections, or disclosures that have been done for the sale, right? So if the seller did disclosures or got inspection reports, or let's say the seller was even provided with an inspection report from the previous buyer. So this is another thing. The, they could have been in contract before and the buyer did like a foundation inspection and gave it to the seller. Now that becomes a material fact, right? So the seller is required to disc disclose those things. So this is um, anything that's in the seller's possession, they have to turn over to the buyer, right? So they can't hide like an inspection report that was done, at least legally, right? They can't do that. Uh, the big one right here, number six, within the last three years, has anybody died on the property, right? Um, so they have to disclose that. Right. So always look at this one. Has anybody died on the property in the last three years? If it was prior to three years, then, you know, they don't have to disclose that note to seller. The manner of death may be a material fact to the buyer and should be disclosed except for a death by HIV or AIDS. So they're now coming out with these things where if someone died like horrifically or like say someone killed themselves or they got murdered or something like that, that could be an issue for a buyer. So they have to now disclose the manner of death. Right. So usually you'll see like if someone died, they'll put yes and they'll say died of peaceful causes, right? Or died of natural causes. Or the opposite, died and this is what happened, right? And that that thing can turn off your buyer. So it just really depends. Every buyer is different, every culture is different with how they look at death and properties, but you definitely want to know about that. Um, is there an order from the government? identifying the property as being contaminated by methamphetamine. This is like if there's like a meth house or anything like that. Um, any illegal controlled substances, substances on the property or beneath the property, right? Is there anything going on on the property that could be an illegal substance? Um, is the property in an adjacent to an industrial zone, right? So maybe you have properties that are near a commercial zone, near an airport, they're in maybe in the downtown area. So you'll see that sometimes. Um, is there any nuisance, right? Let's say it is by an industrial zone. Is there a bunch of noise happening all the time? They would have to list that there. Is the property near a prison or a jail within one mile, right? You don't want no uh, people escaping from jail and showing up to the property, right? So they're going to list that there. Um, is the property, if it's a condo or if it's located in a planned unit development or other common interests, right? So if the property is a condo or a townhouse or it's that type of property, they're going to list that there. And then any insurance claims. So this is important too, guys. When people file insurance claims on properties, um, that information goes into a database where when you buy a property, your insurance is going to look up that database. So it depends what the insurance claim was about. So let's say someone did like a huge insurance claim on their property, like the property burnt down, and they got paid a lot of money or whatever, or some major flood or pipe burst. And then you go to buy this property and you try to get insurance and your insurance does, doesn't wanna uh, insure the property because there was a major claim on this property within the last five years. That can affect someone's ability to, to want or desirability to buy the property, right? So if it's a small insurance claim, not a big deal, but if it's something big, you know, then that's where that can be uh, something that the buyer is going to want to be, that going to want to know about, right? And this could be overlooked, right? Because someone may check yes and they keep going forward with the property and they don't realize till the end because typically they they go try to get insurance at the end of the process when it's time to close the deal, right? And then all of a sudden this thing pops up and they can't get insurance on the property or the insurance is going to be super expensive because of this claim. Uh, matters affecting the title, right? Is there someone else on title that needs to sign off on this? Um, is there something going against the title of the property? Is there liens, lawsuits, anything like that? Uh, any plumbing fixtures that are not compliant with the up-to-date code? 
any material facts or defects affecting the property not otherwise disclosed to the buyer, right? If there's anything else they know, they're gonna put it here. This whole section right here, seven, is all to do with repairs and alterations. So any repairs or modifications or remodeling, anything that was done uh, for the purpose of uh, energy efficiency or water efficiency, any ongoing maintenance, um, let's say they have like a tree service or a pest control service, any part of the property being painted in the last 12 months, a lot of listings are prepped and painted, so they'll put yes. And then they're gonna ask about um, lead-based paint, right? So was anything done before 1978 where there could be exposure to lead-based paint? Or was there anything done to remove that um, and anything done in compliance with the lead-based paint stuff? Okay, we're almost done, guys. Um, structural systems and appliances, right? Any defects with any of the structure, any of the appliances, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, water, sewer, water, sewer waste disposal, anything like that. Um, right here, um, I don't know if this is where it would be, but the leasing of any of the following serving the property. Yes, this right here is important, guys. If they have solar, they have to check yes right here. Right, so if someone has solar, that can be a deal breaker, right? Depending on the 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 how the solar is set up, right? Is it a lease? Is it is it fully paid? Does the buyer have to qualify for this? Are they going to have an additional payment? Are they going to have an additional amount due? So if someone checks yes, that yes, there's a solar system or a water softener or any sort of alarm system that has a lease or a contract, you're going to want to know what's going on with this so that your buyer can decide if they want to move forward. Uh, septic tanks or anything like that is the next one. Disaster relief. This We don't really see that in our area, but it can be like, let's say there was like a fire. Like if anybody lived in those areas that, ha that got hit by fire, um, you'd see something like that. Or if there's like a flood or earthquake, anything like that, where there was some sort of disaster relief or insurance settlement, um, they would note that there. Number 10 is all about water related mold issues. Are you related, you know, are you aware of any leaks, mold, water issues, anything like that? Pets and animals on the property, right? Are there any pets that live there? Is there any urine or stains or smell, or anything like that? Or was any of that stuff treated? Number 12 is boundaries and access to the property by others. You'll see this more when it's like a rural property or a farm or a ranch any surveys, easements or encroachments or disputes about access to the property? Or is there any use of your property by any neighbors? So sometimes, like I said, there could be a road that goes in between two properties that's being used and it's, it's located on your property, but it's used by the neighbors. Uh, number 13 is landscaping, pool and spa. So there's more asking questions about um, any diseases affecting the plants. Any sprinklers, are they automatic, are they not? Is there a pool heater, is there a spa heater? Are there any leaks or anything in the, the plumbing, the drainage, the pool, anything like that? The water pump systems, anything like that. 14 is all about condos. Condos, common interest developments, right? So just going into detail about the condo. Are there any restrictions? Are there any improvements that are being made? Are there any pending lawsuits? So this is important right here. So if there's a lawsuit against the condo complex or an HOA, that will affect your financing, right? So if someone checks yes right here that there's a current litigation, you need to find out immediately uh, and talk to your lender before you move forward on this property. Because I've seen deals get killed because of that, right? Or there's gonna, it's gonna reduce who can lend on that property. Uh, number 15 is all about title ownership any liens or legal claims. So is there anybody else on title that needs to sign? Are there any leases or anything related to the property? Maybe as part of it's being rented and there's a lease. Any lawsuits past or present? Um, adjoining walls, fences, anything like that. Some of these questions are from the TDS as well, similar questions. Encroachments, easements, private transfers. Pace lien, any lien on the property to pay for something. Like sometimes people get a, um, they get their roof done and then they get a, le a, a lease from the company or they get like a loan from the company for a remodeling for their roof or their windows or anything that needs to be paid. Um, 
any cost of any alteration that the property being paid by an assessment on the property tax bill. So sometimes there can be something to do with an improvement that has to be done that's related to the property tax bill. So they want to put that there. 16 is all about, again, guys, going back to neighborhood nuisance. So you see some of this stuff is redundant, right? It's the same thing on the TDS. If there's anything, any neighborhood noise, nuisance, trains, anything that's going to affect the property like that. Any disputes with any neighbors, anything like that. Let's say you had a crazy neighbor. Um, and that's something that is a big deal. They're probably going to put that there. Anything with the government, guys, this section is all about, is there any sort of interference by the government? Is the government doing anything to the area or to the property or building nearby that can affect the desirability of the property, right? They could be with something to do with the zoning. It could be they're building something next door. Um, I know like in my neighbor or my area, they recently built like homeless encampments, those uh, like little areas where homeless people can live. There's like little developments that they live, that they built. So something like that can affect the desirability, right? They've, they've built a few of those and you got to let people know, hey, there's, there's one down the street that they're building. If you know about it, you got to let them know. Um, number 18, any smoking on the property, uh, vaping, any use of the property for alterations, modification, modifications, remodeling with cannabis or cultivation, right? This is something new. This wasn't on there before. Now they're adding all about cannabis. Are people growing cannabis on there? Are they using the property for anything like that? They just updated these things recently. So now it's it's with the times. They even have vaping, right? Vaping was never a word in these things. Now it's vaping is, is on there. So if you vape in your property, I guess you got to disclose it. That's a new one. Um, anything else? This is like the end all be all. Anything else that would affect the value or desirability of a property that wasn't noted up up there, right? And that's where they would put yes or no. That's it, guys. Damn, that was a good review for me too. Uh, because it's been a while since I've I've gone over these in detail. Um, and it's pretty much the same, right? Like in my 20 years of, of being in business, it's pretty much the same. As every few years, they'll revise and they'll come out with a new edition and they'll add certain keywords or things that are relevant for today, like the vaping, the cannabis cultivation, all that stuff was something that's more relevant today. Um, but as you guys see, it's not rocket science, guys. It's really just a list of questions that you got to run through. And when stuff pops up, that's a yes. I think that what sparked this training was Alessandra said, what to look for, right? What do I look for? You want to look for the yeses. Right. You want to look for the yeses and the explanations. Right. If everything else is no, like whatever's no, you don't really need to know. That doesn't really matter for the most part. It's only when there's a yes and there should be an explanation. Now, if there's a yes, here's the other thing, too, because remember, humans fill these out. Right. There can be, you know, a user error. If there's a yes checked and there's no explanation for the yes, then this is where now you need to contact the listing agent to find out. And you need to, because that wasn't filled out correctly. So anytime they check yes, there has to be an explanation of what it's about. Um, and you'll see guys, like I mentioned in the beginning, there are some listing agents who are extremely thorough and there are some who just, they, they, they don't do anything, right? They're not like thorough. They're not that professional. They don't fill these things out correctly. They give you the bare minimum. And that does make our job a little harder because we got to play detective sometimes and, and, and investigate. But that's what it takes, guys. It's if you want to be a higher level agent, you want to be an elite agent, you want to serve your clients at the highest level possible and look out for their best interest. Scanning through the TDS and the SPQ before you go show a home, before you host an open house, before you write the offer, obviously, you're going to do that for sure. But knowing like what the yeses are and things, the explanations, and knowing how to explain these things to the client is going to, what's going to make you stand out above the competition. All right. Uh, let's close it off, guys. Are there any questions about any of this? Enrique, I mean, I jumped on a little later. I just want to understand, like, what is the process to go over this with your clients? Like, how, how does that look? Yeah, great question. Um, anytime we, we write an offer, we always want to set up a consultation for offer review, right? So you want to call it an offer review consultation. 
And in the offer review consultation, we're gonna go over the disclosures. We're gonna go over the contract, the purchase agreement. We're gonna go over the comps. And it's usually gonna be a lengthy, a lengthy uh, consultation, guys. It's gonna be probably at least an hour, right? Because as you see, I only went over two documents in detail. There's all these other documents that come with it. And so that's the part where, you know, you're going into detail with these clients on, on everything about the property and, and what offer to write, because whatever's on the prop on the disclosures is going to affect how they want to move forward with the property. They may want to offer less. They may want to put a, a contingency so that they have enough time to investigate something that's on there. Right. So I always set it up as a formal meeting where, Hey guys, it's important before we move forward on this property that we set up a formal meeting to do an offer review and disclosure review. Right. And in that meeting, and this is what I'm selling to them, right? In that meeting, we're going to go over the disclosures, all the things that you need to be aware of. We're going to see how that's going to affect our offer price. We're going to go over the offer, the comps, all that stuff. And we're going to determine what's the best course of action to move forward with this property um, so that you're protected and that, and that you ultimately get the best deal. Um, so it's always set up as a formal consultation. And a good thing to do also is to send this stuff to the client ahead of time so that they can review it. And then when you meet with them, you're not having to like explain every single page. So I always say, hey, I'm going to send this to you. I want you guys to review it beforehand. And then this way, when we meet, we can now attack all the things that are uh, extremely important to you. Uh, let them know to maybe write down questions so that when we do meet, I can answer all these and clarify these. Um, that's how I would approach it, Jason. Good. Um, Someone said that. Yeah, I just did that last night with Harold and my Zillow Flex League. Yep. And here's the thing is, how do you position this uh, to show why you're more valuable, right? Is when I talk to clients, I would explain, this is my process and this is what I do, right? Because some, of, some agents may do this, but they don't explain that they do this, right? Let me, let me rephrase that, right? Like, okay, let's say all agents do this but I promote that I do this. I use this as part of my marketing. I use this as part of a video, right? You can make a video on this, right? Talking about all the disclosures and why it's important to set up a buyer consultation and an offer, uh, or you can say, this is my process. When I meet with clients, you know, we do an offer review, we do a disclosure review. In that review, I'm gonna go over all these things. The way I just explained it to you, but now you make a video telling your audience that this is how you run your business, right? So there's one thing to do something, but then there's one thing to pack, package it up and use that to market yourself. Do you guys see the difference in that? Does that make sense? Right? Because not don't assume that everyone knows what you do. And that's, that's a big mistake that a lot of agents make. They just assume like, oh yeah, the client knows I'm going to do this, right? No, you actually have to articulate this. You have to explain it. And you have to break it down. This is the process. This is what I do. This is why you want to meet with me. This is how I serve my clients. This is how I protect my clients' interests. This is why this type of meeting is important, right? This is why I'm a more valuable agent. Because if, if you do that, and then the other agent they meet with never even talks about this, even though he may do this, you automatically look better because you've marketed it and you've presented how you do your process, right? So always think from, from a standpoint of how do I market everything that I do, right? How do I package it up and show why I'm valuable to clients? And like Alessandra, when like you have that client where you said they're interviewing two other agents, right? Or another agent, that's a perfect example of what you can do, right? Hey, Brianna, when we meet, this is how I, this is my process. This is what I do with my clients, right? And you break it all down. And then Brianna's like, man, that other guy didn't even mention any of this. He's not even available, right? And then, and you show her properties and you, you know, handpick properties and you show her discounted home and you show all those things. Now the score starts going Alessandra, Alessandra, and the other guy just starts looking like, eh, he's kind of weak, right? So you want to know how to win clients over? Explain your process thoroughly, right? Use it, use it to market yourself. Make videos about this. Use this as content. Who wants to commit to making a video about this? Anybody? Is there anybody who will commit today? Not, ex not explaining in detail like I did, but just explaining like, this is my process. This is what I do, right? Summarizing it in like a one minute. Hey, when I meet with clients, when they're getting ready to write an offer, 
this is this is what I do with my clients, right? Super easy video, right? You're just basically telling them this is what I do. I do an offer review and just give them some of the bullet points on why it's important. And that could be a great way to promote yourself and differentiate yourself. Who is down? Raise your hand. If you're down, they'll make a video about this, right? Put out a video. And just one. I need more than a day, but I mean, who needs more than a day? Miles? All right, Miles, unmute yourself, bro. I got to call you out right here. This is for your growth right here. <laughs> Why do you need more than a day? I really don't. I just have to write some stuff down and then just go over it, but I can do it. Okay. Here's the thing. I'm going to stop recording, right? Because we're now getting in. Give me two minutes, guys, and we're done. Um,